through some processing of all these apartments, and uh, um, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Koporikova uh, for today's seminar. So she is an associate professor in Washington Lee University. She just got tenure last yes. year. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so she has a really, really unique sort of trajectory to come to uh, Washington Lee. So she has a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering. Uh, she received a PhD degree in Florida State in math, and she uh, went on to do the postdoc at, sorry, <laughs> McGill in Canada, and followed by Georgia Tech in Georgia, Atlanta, before she moved to Washington Lee. Uh, so the, my first uh, interaction with her was back in May when we went to the Circadia meeting uh, in Florida, actually. And then we just found ourselves that we're both from Southwest Virginia. And then we started the conversation, we started the collaboration actually. So I went to their school, Lexington, like two hours north of here, this past weekend to um, sacrifice some animals <laughs> this past weekend. And that's why I have this Washington Lee shirt on yeah. today. Uh, so the message that I wanted to convey here is that you talk, you go to the meeting and to talk to people because you never know when or who you're gonna find, uh, and then what kind of you know what that leads to the next level. I didn't think that by going to the meeting that I was gonna find a collaborator for the future, but I did, and they were working together, which is a totally different topic from what she's gonna tell us today. So today, she is going to talk to us about the computational model uh, for the spider circadian clock. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I will, um, I will finish yeah. and then <laughs> the floor is yours. OK, and I will just co continue on the Jihoka's theme of like how does this collaboration start. So this one is start particularly, I mean, I guess unusual. We have a student, Andrew Ma, who was like, who's a, was in, who wor start working in the lab of Yes, I think I am. Yeah, I have green light. Okay, okay. yeah. So who studied the spider, but he's just come to me and said, you know, like, I love the spider work, but I actually would love to do something in neuroscience. I took, like, these courses in neuroscience. Can we do something in neuroscience with spiders? And I was like, wow, that, that, that's an interesting question. I know nothing about spiders. Now I grew up like that much. Okay, if you guys have a very thorough, circuited uh, question about spider, I might answer, might not, but... Uh, but no, anyway, so we start looking at the different systems and we find like, oh, look, there's like a really, really cool um, paper about circadian rhythm in spiders. There's two guys on Eastern Tennessee State University uh, working on this project. Why don't we call them? So we randomly call them, start talking, and we just established this collaboration when my colleague in my department, Nadia Ayub, evolutionary biologist of spiders, there's these behavioral people who work generally on the uh, bees and circadian rhythm is bees, but they also study spiders. And I'm like a modeling person on the project, so we all came together. And for the last year and a half, it was like joy. Like it's, we still don't know most of the answer, but it was fun to actually stumble on the project, which is pretty much nothing is known. So you cannot make a most, you can make as many mistakes as you know the answer is unknown. So, but. Before we start, let's just talk a little bit about circadian rhythm. Some of you probably know it, some of the not. So if you are familiar, please take a nap. I won't be uh, like, you know, angry, don't snore. But if you don't know, I will kind of give you some, maybe an overly thorough intro introduction, but it's too much than too little. So generally, all physiological processes and most of the organisms studied so far uh, operate on the daily periodic rhythm. So like internal circadian guide, uh, drives a lot of physiological activities. And, you know, so like obviously day and night change the light schedule, influence our um, activities, but also the temperature can uh, regulate or like the social environment, we're all aware about that. And usually it's this process called entrainment. So you entrain your internal rhythms with the environment. And the, uh, the stimulus which causes entrainment usually called a Zeitgeber. It's a kind of tough terminology, so I will repeat it several times. Uh, the interesting things, though, about circadian rhythm, so even when entrainment is gone, even the Zeitgeber is not there, the rhythm is still there uh, in the absence. And one of the coolest 
things we learn. Oh God, this studies, I just cannot really. Every time I talk about circadian rhythm, it's really awesome studies. How we, most of we learn is actually through this old 1950s bonkers in Munich when the Weaver, call of Weaver's bonkers, when some volunteers come and live in weeks in the very dim light so and they have no idea what time it is there was like experimenter was very clever they just put the, a newspaper there was time with newspapers then with the wrong date and even men who work in this bunker I did not allow it to shave on the schedule. They have to be shaved at different times of day. So, but again, it was 1950s, so no cell phone. I don't know if now, now they could find a volunteer live without technology for like two weeks. I think we all will get an anxiety model, not the circadian one. But it was 1950s, and actually I talked to someone who was actually wrote a dissertation there. They say it's like the best time to write. There is no day, no night. You're just like not disturbed by anything. But anyway. So let me just lead you a little bit through this experiment. So here, I'll just show you it's very common tool for circadian biologists called actogram. So and we starting day from zero and all the way down one to three for 10. And here the line, the solid line represent the sleeping phase of the volunteer who's in the bunker. And the uh, dashed line is activity. They walking around, moving, doing something. And the triangle is going for the uh, body temperature. And this is before person enter the bunker, so they are living on pretty much regular schedule. You probably can see where weekend were, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. yeah, so here, Lee, that was like somebody stay a little bit later, but overall came to his senses and have a pretty regular schedule. So what's happen if this person enter the bunker? Interesting things start happening. You can see here that every single day this person wake up a little bit later than usual, and it's kind of like a drift. So you can see this kind of uh, rebounds of activity. So and the body temperature is moving to the beginning of the cycle. And uh, what's happened if we are return person to the natural conditions? Everything returned to its senses pretty fast. Oh, okay. Huh? I'm still I'm still working on that one. So uh, so our rhythm returned to the entrainment as soon as the light stimulus coming back. So that was a really important fundamental work which tell us that even without the light or environmental clue, there is still periodic rhythm, but it's a little bit longer than 24 hours. Um, but that's all lovely. We probably cannot find the volunteers that easily this day. So most of the experiment in circadian field done with animals. So I will introduce it to the actogram, which is now for like can record any type of activity. You can, you can do the eating, drinking, uh, temperature, anything you want. And typically what you have an octogram is two bars on the top or sometimes there's a shading. So the lights represent the light activity. So something where there's a pro presence of light, the dark represent total darkness. And uh, there is, you can see that there's a bunch of this kind of like a bunch of bars stuck together. And these bars represent the activities. And it can be different type of activity depends on the experiment. Uh, for example, it can be uh, eating the amount of food or water animal consume within a given time. For example, here one uh, bar represents integrated activity over an hour. So we can say it's like or average temperature over an hour. In, uh, for us, because we are measuring activity of the spiders, we put them in a chamber, and in the middle of the chamber, there is the infrared beams. And every time spider crosses this beam, there is like the event generated by, in the software. So for us, for spiders, this uh, bar height of this bar represents number of beam crossing event in the hour. So let me just show you one representative activities of the spider in this chamber. So you can see here, again, light represent the uh, chamber with the lights on. The shaded area represented the dark time. And then you see here right away, as soon as light is gone, the spiders wake up and within 20 minutes start running around this chamber. chamber. And it lasts for a couple hours and the rest of the day. So the actogram ends here and starts on the next line right away. So you can clearly see that there is a regular activity or entrainment. So what's happened if we put our Spartan in the constant darkness? And again here, it's all shaded, so it is a constant darkness. So the hour written now, very similar to our bunker volunteers, it's periodic. 
and we call it as a free running period. And uh, every day now the activity comes a little bit earlier. So we can uh, basically feed activity with a line, find the slope of the line, and calculate what's called free running period or the period of activity without any uh, stimulus, which is in, here, in this case 23 and a half hours. Um, Okay, and in general, for most of the species we know, have a very narrow range of free running period. In naturally occur occurring situations, so non-mutants, obviously there is a circadian mutants which have too short or too long periods, but we're talking about the wild animals. They generally have a free running rhythm between 22 and 26 hours. Um, and been, uh, there's been several studies when this kind of um, uh, clock was manipulated. And in all situations, it's a uh, result in the you know, worst conditions uh, for the organism. For example, uh, the course in 1997 did an awesome experiment when they uh, removed cl circadian clock from the uh, squirrels and let them in the wild. And uh, squirrels without clock died from predation in much higher rate than the one which has a, just basically a sham surgeries. Uh, then there is a pretty cool experiment in, uh, with Emerson in 2008 when they actually put the uh, um, mosquitoes at the different light schedules. And again, the one which did not follow their natural circadian clock end up with uh, fewer offspring, um, more mortality. Um, the same pretty much if your clock is too early or too, f too fast or too slow, you also pay an evolutional price. For example, in cyanobacteria, they put the cyanobacteria with a different frequency, intrinsic frequency in the different light dark schedule and the, uh, uh, the um, uh, strains which did not follow their own clock was overcompeted. But basically what I'm trying to say that there is seen that there is some kind of significant evolutionary cost for having a clock outside of the normal 24 hours period. So it must be some kind of adaptive benefits, at least from we know so far, there is a very, very narrow range when they're uh, for the free running rhythm in circadian clocks. Um, at, that's we know a year and a half ago before we met actually spiders because spiders seems to broke this rule easily. Uh, for example, uh, that was like three years ago when we discovered first spider with just extremely fast free running rhythm. So here you see a, a cyclosis spider and again this is a free running rhythm. You see the slope is really high. So there is a very short free running period, 18.8 hours. And again, here I give you like another tool to measure circadian period called periodogram. Basically, the peak represents free running period, 18.8 hours. There, and we still, since then, we find another uh, species, for example, uh, Acyclosa, 19.9 hours. Gastrocantra, 19 hours. But not spiders are that fast. Actually, there is one which is kind of normal in the typical range. For example, Metazigia, which I will show a lot of data from Metazigia just because she seems to be one of the normal ones with 22.2 hours period. But Paraceatoda and the Larinoides are also pretty close to the 24 hours. And if, you, if that variety of circadian clock and spider does not satisfy you, we also have a slow spider's uh, clock. For example, Frontinella, 28 hours. Um, uh, uh, the stellata is 28.5 hours. So you tell me what kind of spider you want, uh, what kind of circadian clock you want, I'll probably find you a spider. Not me, but my collaborators. There is also one which does not seem to be a, have a rhythm. For example, here it's a, a black widow's, which you can see she's pretty rhythmic when we give a light dark schedule without light. She's all over the place. So there is no seems to be rhythmicity. And we have 20 plus black widows right now and all of them are, does not seem to have any rhythm. So the question is, if there is such a big evolutionary co uh, costs for having your circadian clock close to environment, how does spiders does not follow the rules? 
And again, this is the spiders. It's not like lab species. I picked up some outside of my uh, apartment, uh, my house. We collect them in uh, under the rock and everywhere in Virginia and uh, Eastern Tennessee. We actually brought some even from Pittsburgh just to make sure that it's not like something about southeastern US. So they are very old species, well adopted species, and yet they seem to break all the rule of circadian rhythmicity. Some do, some not. Like there is, a, there is not very clear cut. So there is some trend for one of the evolutionary branch go shorter, but there is also like another branch when there is a seems to be a mix. But yeah, we have an evolution. We constructed evolutionary tree. Yes. Yes, there is a couple species which uh, only. We only find two species of really diurnal spiders. Most of them are actually ac active during the night. So it's not very common. So it's very few species which are. But you know, they, we actually sp find these two species of the spiders, which is diurnal or crepuscular, I'd say. They still have a quite different uh, length of circadian clock. So uh, you know, yes. No, 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 go ahead. I love the question. Yeah. I think there is some. I will talk about it later. But yeah, we have like a number of conversations. So one of the unique things about spiders, they're both prey and predator. Mm -hmm. So they are hunt, they, they wait for their prey at night, but they also been picked up by birds. So there is like some kind of double pressure. They also have to repair their web. So there is several unique things which might work to their advantage. So yeah, I'll, I'll touch on some of the ideas. We don't have to, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, evolutionarily speaking, are the ones with faster clocks further along or? or we couldn't, f oh, believe me, we dig through that. We so wanted to find the patterns. We don't see the pattern yet, but we just maybe didn't go through all the data yet. We maybe didn't ask the right questions yet. But oh god, we try to find what's so special about them. Is there something special about, like one of my colleagues have like this brilliant idea, you know, like there is this species of spiders which have to repair their web at the end of the night and have to uh, and have collect their, uh, their prey in the beginning of the night. Maybe there is makes a difference. And no, it did not. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'll show you the excellent question. I'll show you data later. I actually have a pretty cool prediction about that. Great. OK. So, But you know, I probably disappoint you in a lot of answers because we actually don't know what the mechanism of circadian clock or even how like they sense light. So spider system, nervous system wasn't, sp uh, wasn't studied extreme wasn't studied well yet. So there is a lot of open answers. But we can start by first looking at the activity. So it seems like they all adjust to the light. No matter what their free running period is, they all perfectly entrained by light. So and this is the typical recording. Actually, we, it's integrated activity. We take 17 spiders and put their data together in this one massive actogram. And you can see that during the life, this is a metazygia, normal or close to 24 hour cycle. And you can see that during the light, nothing interesting really happens. But there is such a strong response to the darkness. As soon as the lights goes off, they jump out and start moving around. So, and it's very representative activity. Most of them are activated by the dark phase. The only difference there is some of them who has like second bout of activity right here when again some of them have to repair their web for the next day and some of them do eating and repairing like multitasking you know so that's a good question why they, they prefer to do it this way. Um, but you know it seems like light doing like you know amazing work at adjusting the free running period to 24 hours. Sadly enough, there is no mechanism of light, but there is pretty cool circadian uh, tools for measuring response to the light. And let me just introduce you, uh, let's just go back for a moment, back to our 
bunker status and let's again work with a um, individual which stay instead of the bunker so he, he or she stayed for in the light dark schedule for a while and finally here it switches she or he switches to the um, total darkness and uh, again the dark line represent the um, Sleeping light represent the activity, so you can see that this person starts free running with a free running period a little bit larger than 24 hours. So now let's do something interesting to this person. Let's, even though they are in a constant darkness or deep, dim light, let's give a shot, pulse of bright light somewhere here, you know, like in the middle of activity phase. You know, they're in the dark, they should respond, aren't they? In reality, it's not. If you give the pulse of light in the middle of the active period, mm, there is absolutely no change in activity. However, and you know, like you just keep free running like nothing happened. However, the story differs slightly if you give this pulse of light in the beginning of the um, inactive period, right here. You know, like imagine like you just fall asleep and somebody shines the light into it. Not pleasant experience, but been done a number of times. Thanks volunteers. So what's happened in this situation is you actually obviously wake up, move around, so you stay longer one day, then you wake up next day with a delay, and you continue if you don't have any, oh, 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 God, I did something horrible here. Don't get too excited when you give a talk. I do it all the time. Okay, now no drama. Okay, <laughs> continue with less drama. Uh, so uh, we have like this short delay which continues for duration of the study. What's happen if you give the pulse of light later in the um, uh, subjective night? You will have larger delay like here, for example. What if you give the light later in the subjective night? Things happen instead of the delay. You might have an actual advance. Things about the time when somebody wake you up at 5 a.m. and you couldn't fall asleep. That's pretty much the good. I mean, it's not, we don't know the mechanism, but you can have an experience. Uh, and actually, if you uh, give a slide later at the uh, subjective night, you will have a little bit less advance. So, as a scientist, we like to quantify everything. So we can quant call these changes in the schedule. We call it a phase shift. And we do not delay as a negative. Advance is a positive. So here, for example, we have minus one, minus three for delay and for, and for advance, and we can plot them as a diagram. So again, we separate subjective day and subjective night. And on the y-axis, what, God, what's going on? I really can't, this is a sensitive thing. Yeah, it's okay, we'll practice here. So you can see here, when we give a pulse in the middle of the subjective day, nothing happened. Uh, in the beginning of subjective night, we'll have a delay. For other, we have a no delay. And you can keep practicing and giving the pulse at the different times to construct this curve, which has a name. It's called phase response curve. And it uh, was measured in the number of the animal models. And the shape is you know, more or less concerned. We'll talk a little bit about the details. So, uh, it's usually have an advanced phase and delay phase, and usually the delay phase in the, middle, in the beginning of subjective nights and delay in the later. And uh, overall, this kind of uh, phase response curve, PRC, is different slightly. One of them are uh, called type Y PRC or weak PRC. Uh, when there is all changes happens gradually. So you see here that both advance and the delay is do not exceed four hours, but it's also gradual progression from advance to the delay. Uh, the delay increases and then decreases versus the strong phase response curve is basically break it down. Often the, the topologically different, mathematically it's completely different curves. So here, for example, for the type zero strong PRC, the uh, delay only increases. And at some point, obviously, more than 12 hours delay became advanced. We live in a 24-hour cycle, so it breaks down. So my collaborator, bless his heart, Daryl, actually conduct the heroic experiment when he applied the pulses of light at different times of day of circadian of spiders and reconstructed the phase response curve for the, for the spider. So here again, we have a delay, delay on the bottom, advance on the top, 
And you can see the spiders do have very strong response to light. So we have up to 12 hours uh, delay and significant advance. So they seems to be, and it's a pretty, it's a light intensity was similar to the normal room light. So it's, there is nothing really. Generally, if you apply stronger pulses of light, you can cause a shift from weak to the strong PRC. But here, it was reasonably you know, normal light, but it still produced very strong response. So spiders seems to sense light and response to the light much stronger than the other creatures we study. So, and that was very excited. However, the trouble is we have absolutely no idea what is a mechanism, biological mechanism for the spider light sensitivities. Uh, we dig through like probably, God, we spend like months, my students spend months digging through the PubMed and all we find that is like a couple of experiments that's like, yeah, they have eyes and these eyes do respond to certain frequency of light. And all papers is, uh, was very vague on any mechanism or biological components involved. So, although it's very excited, we have no clue. How does circadian rhythm work in spiders? Or how does they sense the light? So we have to kind of slow down and start thinking how we can learn. So we basically have to start from scratch. We barely know. Other than the silk gland, which was extensively studied in spiders, the rest of the spiders, Nobody was interested before, but uh, we definitely need to start taking the data and construct the whole biological mechanism from nothing, and it's pretty, pretty hard. So we decide to engage the mathematical modeling component to help us to understand the light-sensitive mechanism and the uh, circadian clock. Um, so we decided to build a model of circadian clock, and although we don't know any involved mechanism, we can start looking at the other known circadian clock in spiders. And what we know, for example, here, there is a Drosophila, very simplified diagram. I apologize to circadian people that I'm really boiled down to most essential elements, but overall, there is few components here. So we have several genes which in, uh, inhibit transcriptional activations. And if we look at other species, for example, Neurospora, again, there's a different genes and a different network, but again, we see the common factors. There is uh, several genes which dimerize and inhibit the transcriptional activations. Uh, and in mammals, again, more genes involved, larger network, but there is still this essential element of negative uh, inhibition of transcriptional activation. And although we know nothing about the spiders, it will be reasonable to assume that they might have the same mechanism, some kind of inhibitory, trans uh, inhibitory control of transcriptional regulations. What if we design the model from scratch? Since we don't know not much, we don't assume much, we'll just say, uh, okay, since we don't have any biological information, we just make a simplest negative feedback model we can come up with. And the simplest model will have, a, I mean, we still have to kind of include the nuclear event. So we'll say, okay, there is a cell, there's a nucleus, there's a cytosol, there is some mRNA. We have no idea what it is, so we call it mRNA-X, yet unknown mRNA. Um, but um, it translates into the protein. Again, since we don't know, we'll call it protein-X. And this protein, I mean, it's also degrade. I mean, neither mRNA or uh, protein cannot stay forever, so there we have to take a degradation into account. And the protein acts travel back from the cytosol to the nucleus and inhibit its own transcription. It's pretty basic model, but can we learn something from this model? And again, we adopted it from Neurospora, so we call it Neurospora-like model. Um, again, we don't know where the light acts here, have no idea, but since we have a model, we can just simulate it anywhere. Since we only have a three components uh, and uh, a limited number of parameters, we can up, down, regulate all system of parameters, explore them all, and uh, put two, and select one which kind of look like our spider. So it's, there's a two simple criteria for selecting this uh, parameters. 
we need to have a wide range of the free running periods. The model should produce something between 16 and 32 hours. Otherwise, that's not really a spider. And all, and if light, if we truly want to simulate effect of light, this between 16 and 32, all of this free running period should be entrained to 12 hours light dark cycle. So only parameters which can uh, make us perfect entrainment will go. Uh, we also would like to have a shape of the PRC, the type zero PRC, which we experimentally collected. And again, thanks to my brave students who explored every single possibility in this model, actually we find that most of, the, uh, of this mechanism are not working. The only mechanism which give us the uh, uh, model which satisfied this criteria was only one. And in this scenario is the light induced very fast degradation of our mRNA. Only in these conditions we can get wide range of free running periods which is in train to the 12 hours light dark cycle. Um, I don't know if that's correct. Yes. Uh, because if you do inhibition of production, you cannot entrain. So they don't entrain. They entrain, but in the very narrow range. And it's, by the way, and this is independent degradation. So, and it's very fast, fast order degradation, different from the natural one. So we can hypothesize that the light induce fast degradation of our mysterious mRNA acts. Ah, is it right or not? I don't know. Why won't we run an experiment, make a prediction, and see if any of our uh, predictions can be useful in any sense that guide us in the further experiment. And this is, I, again, guys, you all young and just started science, I strongly encourage you to use the modeling for like exploring scenarios which maybe not be workable in the lab, or trying the different, like, uh, again, I'm doing what's called a hypothesis-driven modeling. You create the hypothesis, instead of like having like 100,000 experiments you can do in the lab, you can narrow it down to maybe 20 potential experiments, which is, you know, it's actually sometimes really good. So a non-spending time in the lab and non-doing experiment which is doomed is, believe me, I've done as a graduate student a couple of doomed experiments, which now I'm thinking back, but, you know, experience. So modeling can help you make your life a little bit easier. Okay, but okay, let's take our model and uh, simulate two free running periods. One is a longer, another one shorter. So here is our uh, free running period, 27 hours, and we entrain it to 12 hour light dark cycle, and you see our mRNA follow faithfully, and if we have a 17 uh, hours free running period, again, it's adapted perfectly fine to the 12 12. However, look, there is a difference here. So when we have a longer free running period, the peak of our mRNA coming later in the day versus for the short free running period, we have a very early peak. So we actually can make an interesting prediction. So the shorter free running period spiders might need this peak of activity earlier in the day versus the spiders with a long free running period have a peak of, we hope that the mRNA activity follow mRNA, of course it's a big assumption, but that's all we can do. Um, and that one is actually pretty easily to, I mean, we're digging through the data right now. We confirm it in uh, six species, but we have five more species to go. So I would say I'm 50% confident in this prediction, but if anything in science, uh, I might well, yes. So before you choose this uh, free running animal, before you I don't know. We haven't measured it yet. I have no idea. This is just prediction, just the model. So. Yeah, if the in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're planning, and I will talk later. So we actually did collect the data on the measure and uh, and RNA seq. So we hope to see that. But what I what we are doing right now, we're actually looking at behavioral activity. So since you, I mean, since protein follow mRNA and behavior hopefully follow the protein, you might expect that your peak of activity 
will have the same phase relationship. So what we're doing right now, we're digging through the data on the behavioral activity of spiders and comparing the peak of activities on the spiders with a short or long free riding period. And that's 50% our prediction is confirmed, but yeah. Okay, so another interesting thing. So what's happened, and somebody asked about the question about what's happened during the constant light. Um, again, we can look at our model. That's easy to do in the model. Push one button, you have it. With experiments, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, okay, so like here, I'm, I'm giving you both mRNA and protein. So and you can see here that there is a mRNA expression in the blue and the protein follow it in the red. So what's happened if we put this model in the constant light? Nothing, really. The activity dies completely. So what's happened with the short free airing period? The same. Everything goes into the steady state. So we have actually pretty cool prediction. So if that's the mechanism of uh, light sensitivity in spiders, then if we put them in the constant light, we should see no written. And Yes, so it's basically degrade mRNA. So although, you know, so mRNA basically go into some kind of steady state. So, um, and again, this summer we run number of experiments when we put like seven different type of spiders in the chambers and monitor the activity first in trend and then in the constant dark, uh, constant light, sorry. So in here is a frontinella. Again, I selected several of them. So again, she's uh, in the entrainment region. This is dark. This is light. She's active during the dark, not active during the light. So what's happened if we put it in her in constant light? Nothing. She just sits there. And again, we only get it for seven days because again, you know, we cannot keep them for too long. They'll die. But okay, so what's happened if we return the dark? She active again. She moves around. Okay, so, and again, I only put it like several of them. So we have like 10, 12 recording for this one of them. Okay, let's look at another one. That's Metasigia. So what's happened with her? Again, she's a little bit more robust moving spider. So generally, Metasigia love to move around. And again, she has like this delayed response to the darkness. What's happened in the light? Nothing. She doesn't move. You just sit there for seven days straight. When it's Richard, she like new. So... It seems at least, again, we, we, we only collect, we, we're still looking at the finalizing the results, but it seems like they do not really move much in a constant light. So maybe, just maybe, that's kind of, there is some sense in this mechanism. So, uh, and again, since we, our model is very simple, we have only three elements. So we have a, a mRNA X, which stimulate production of a uh, protein, we call it X, and, si uh, and it's moved to the, translocates into the nucleus and inhibit its own secretion. And in the absence of light, this model produced very robust oscillations. You know, here on the left is the light intensity and how now it's zero, so it's all very nice. So on what's happened when we apply small amount of light because it's degrade mRNA, it's dump our oscillations slightly. So still, with a weak light, we still have oscillations, but they are much smaller amplitude. And when the light is stronger, the oscillations are gone. So this system, so basically there is a two different states in this system. They usually refer as a bistable system. So this is a system which is capable of oscillating, produce periodic oscillations. It's also, when you change the parameter value, in which in this case, the light intensity, it can be in a steady state. So maybe the reason why we can adjust to the wide range of free running period is because every time there is a light present in the system, it just kills the oscillations. The circadian rhythm maybe just does not exist in light. This Spiders don't have any circadian rhythm. And we, every time the lights comes down, the oscillations start from scratch. And every uh, morning, they died dramatically. Yeah. So um, 
the bi stable system is very common. You often see them like in the neuroscience. When I, I came from the area of neuroscience, we see the bi stability there often. In physiology, you see them from time to time. Systems biology looks at the uh, synthetic biology, look at the bi stable switches. So they are present over life. There is also pretty cool properties of bi stable system. Because you don't have any memories of the previous oscillations, when lights come in and erase the memory oscillations, next night they start from scratch. So they don't have any memory, they don't have any transients, which means like if the system is bistable, you don't have any jitter from the previous cycle. It won't have any transients, it won't have any jet lag. So basically, if our spiders are bistable, they should do not experience jet lag. And I approached my collaboration with this crazy idea for experiments, like, you know, like, let's just put them, I'm sure, like, let's just try to do the jet lag on the spiders. He's like, wow, that's, you know, so he was, he's a really nice guy. So he actually spent 20 or 30 very tough days to measuring it, but we did measure the uh, jet lag in spiders. So in here, again, we're coming back to recording of uh, uh, spider activity. Again, the black represents the activity here. The red dot show you the peak of activities. So for the first seven days, they are in the entrainment late dot situations. And here on the right, there is a modeling simulations. So here, all I did is just took the mRNA and I just shaded it just for you to easy to see the comparison. And what our model predict, if we do six hours advance, so we will, our light will degrade our mRNA, it will stay steady and low, and then the oscillation will come back like there is no changes, like from new. So what's happened, but, but that's normally doesn't happen with a living system. If ever if you fly in a different time zone, you felt like expect, like you, it takes three, four, five days, usually one hour per day. So what's happened with our spiders? they actually did not seem to be bothered by this six hour advice. It's like, you know, they just flew to Europe, come back and haven't even noticed any changes. So they came up right away. So next day, like there was no advance. Okay, clearly six hours is not a challenge for the spiders. Let's try 12 hours. Let's just do, I mean, 12 hours, you can call it advance or delay, doesn't really matter uh, in this case, okay. So we basically, at one point, we will move in 12 hours all schedule. So let's have and let's, let's see what's happened with our spiders. Ah, this is where nature and math collide. It was a beautiful model, but clearly one protein, one mRNA, maybe not quite enough. So spiders actually have like whole two day to adjust to the hour, 12 hour delay, which is, I mean, that's actually amazing, like two days. It's, it's pretty fast still, but clearly our model can explain a lot of things, but not everything. So there is a lot of things we need to understand. So at this point we were all very excited, but then it's just like, okay, you have a model. Now we actually need to figure out what's happened, what kind of gene involved. So we, we decided, okay, this is the time to actually collect the data. So we decided, okay, we will run experiment and we collect mRNA and we will sequence it and we will figure out how does the light affect, or what is the mechanism. But again, mRNA, yes. Oh, no, that, there's no question. Because your, your model is always with the spider in the, in the same time span, and then so it can take off with two days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think this thinking take away that uh, the same time with the spider? No, again, the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's actually harder for them. Yes, you're right. I could put it back and it will be a little bit easy. Okay, I admit freely that the specific protocol was like designed to basically fit to our life schedule. <laughs> so it's really hard to like a human has to be there. So yeah, I, it would be ideal if it would start at the different times, but since somebody has to supervise the experiment and somebody has to be in the lab, we design it at this time. I mean, in the model, I can do it at any time. That's easy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, if it's dark, oh yeah, that yeah, yeah. If it's in a constant darkness, they will be returned to their free running period. So but in the light they stayed silent. So yeah, if I would put the darkness here, they would be recovering, or if I put 12, uh, like 24 hours of darkness, they would return to the free running period. But since there is a light, they just, I mean, again, the model is pretty simple. It's just, you know, there's a steady state which established. But what's happened with the real spider, how oh, I would love to know. But I cannot answer that one yet. But uh, we decide to, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So like we finish it's like basically. Yeah. So we copy basically this piece over here. So this. So it's like 40, 48 hours I actogram. So and it's done by we copy this party here and put the next day. Then we copy this day to the left and put the next day. So you have, you kind of see it's better when it's two days in a row, but it's a little bit tricky, but yeah. So this is like two days. So day one, they kind of come back early, got confused, but the next day, they pretty close to the light dark schedule. Second day, pretty close, third one, pretty much start running. And we have like eight different recordings. So they are pretty representative. So they all come back within two, three days. Any other questions? Okay, so then we'll just go to the experimental design. And again, guys, because there's so many students here, I decide to kind of maybe go ahead and just to sell you. The modeling is really great for a lot of different things. So we, we used it here to make a prediction about the mechanism, but it's also really good at using it to design your experiment. Because it's easy to collect, I mean, mRNA collection became like cheaper, so we collect a lot of data. But then comparing the so much noise to identify the difference, find the meaningful information, you have to think. I find that I think so much more about experimental design with a lot of data. This is the noisy data, so you have to think really hard when and what you collect and how you compare. So here we went actually to experiment on the data collection using modeling to predict uh, for the time prediction. Um, so we are trying to understand what kind of genes involve in the circadian, uh, circadian rhythm in spiders. Most importantly, what genes involved in the light sensitivities in spiders. So we collect you know, RNA sequence, and again, it's expensive, so you don't want to collect too much, you don't want to sequence too much, so there's a lot of balancing act here. But we will try to use a simple experimental design. We put our spiders in the chambers and train them for several days. Then we divide them into the two groups. One group would get a light pulse, so they will sense the light. Second group won't have a light pulse. And by comparing these two groups, identifying the genes which has a differential expression in response to light, we can identify genes which involved in the light sensitivity in spiders. However, there is a lot of ambiguity. It's great design, but there is a lot of different times it can go wrong. So we need to find the optimal times for putting this pulse there. We we'll also need to figure out at what time we need to collect. And model was very useful for that one. Uh, for fir first one for the uh, time pulse, you know, like uh, phase response curve give us pretty good idea. The maximum shift we have between 16 and uh, in, uh, in 19 hours. And we kind of like run some analysis, uh, use the model to predict that probably 18 hours would be the best pulse time. So now, you know, so we will have again here, I'm use this red steps as my light, light on, light off, light on, light off. So we will run it for three days and then wait for 18 hours and we give short one hour pulse of light. So what our model predicts us? Our model predicts that in response to light, our mRNA will have a advance. And for the group which did not have a light pulse will continue as it's supposed to. So now we actually have a pretty good idea when to collect. For example, if we're not lucky and if we collect it at this time, our gene expression in two groups will be pretty close. So what we collect here would be a noise. 
So we will never get a reliable result at this time point. So again, I don't know if a model is correct, but it's better than nothing. So however, if we are wait a little and collect, for example, in this time point, we will see the big separation between the light and low light experiment. So when we compare expression of these two genes, we should see a, a difference. And again, my student Adrian, he ran this uh, like experiment for every time and we identify that around 10 hours after the pulse should be, if our model correct, should be an optimal time for the gene correction. So we went ahead and we collected samples and I dropped them in Virginia Tech core and I don't, cannot tell you what's happened yet because I just don't know. Hopefully, finger crossed, we might identify something. And again, genome, uh, spider genome haven't been sequenced yet, so it's a lot of work ahead of us. But again, our options were collect randomly at random time or get some kind of information for the model. So, and I kind of strongly advocate this kind of, it's not very commonly used, but it can be a very powerful tool, especially when the options is nothing. So, um, generally, so like, let me just summarize everything. So we, spiders seems to be have a wide range of free running period. Uh, we try to simulate this mechanism using very simple feedback model and by exploring this model we identify a rapid mRNA degradation as a potential mechanism for the light. Then uh, we run several predictions, for example, phase of um, entrainment uh, is shorter for the uh, shorter free running period. Uh, we also determine that there is no, should be no activity in the light and we confirm it experimentally. Finally, we come up with the optimal, we use model to come up with the optimal protocol for the, uh, the collect, sample collections and uh, hopefully we will see results soon. Maybe next year I'll come and tell you if it's worked or did not. You know, science is, you can put the best effort, but it's very bare bone model. So there's probably a lot of things involved. And just before you go, I give you like one like very speculative idea. Do you guys see a spider here? Wasn't easy to find, isn't it? So the interesting things about spiders, they pay a very hefty evolutional price for moving in the light. They don't hide, they sit in the middle of their net. And the birds usually do not notice them. The only chance for bird to notice the spider here, if she moves. Movement for spider in the light means death which means that evolutionary price for movement is pretty high. Mice in a burrow at night can move as much as you want. Nobody see her. Spider, he cannot afford it. So I kind of, maybe it's a wild hypothesis, but you can hypothesize for the species like this, when survival depends, being paralyzed by the light sounds like pretty good evolutionary adaptation. So, that's just an idea. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but um, we can believe and test and run an experiment and maybe we'll learn something in the process. And uh, finally, this is my like awesome collaborator. So like every experiment I showed you hasn't been done. I haven't touched spiders. No, I collected a couple spiders, all I did. But uh, Daryl Morrow and uh, uh, T.J. Jones from Eastern Tennessee State University, these two heroes of this research who spent endless hours collect, uh, I mean, doing, uh, doing spider behavioral work. Uh, Andrew Ma, who started this work, now is NYU in the grad school, so he did a lot of behavioral experiments. He actually spent half of the summer in Lexington, half of the summer there, collecting the Adrian Lam, who ran a lot of behavioral analysis and a lot of simulations. Finally, Nadia Yubava, evolutionary and molecular biologist, who's uh, now in hard at work trying to reconstruct evolutionary trees. So it's a really awesome collaboration. I hope you guys, you will have an awesome collaboration in your life and um, I'll happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the temperature seems to melt. Oh. Why the temperature 
Oh God, I do not, I don't think anybody knows, but that's very well documented response when the body temperature shifted the peak of the, I, I really do not know that, but it seems to be, is, are you asking about the temperature? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so there's very persistent in the free rhyming period, again, the phase basically, but I suspect that's probably a fact of like free running period when your phase is moving, like, like for example, for spiders, the slow spiders have a phase uh, like, Peak of the uh, peak of the uh, mRNA later, so I suspect it's probably related to this uh, phase changes due to the free running period. But I'm speculating here. I don't think anybody knows the mechanism. Do you know? I don't think anybody know why the peak of the temperature changes. But it's very fascinating response, being documented. But I don't. I I, I searched for a while trying to figure out the mechanism. I don't think it's known. No. Yeah. But it's really cool. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just start from the first one. I, you will be the next one. Sorry. Yeah. So it um, seems like according to your model, the mic is essentially just turning out the thing you would get yeah. the whole clock, right? So that being said, if you uh, put the spider in, let's say, a light dark cycle that's not like 24 hours, mm -hmm. you put it in 18, 12, or 36. You pretty much describing what the Daryl doing right now. Which is, again, it's a nightmare type of experiment, but yeah, so like, yeah, he was like very, not even cohesive when I talked to him last time. Because yeah, so exactly what he's doing, so we're just putting them in this weird, like, dark schedule. And uh, we will see if they follow, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, okay. Model is just say, they follow. Yeah, that's easy peasy, but uh, real spiders, that's a different story, yes. They don't seem to be. They just like don't move. They just huddle. There's a, it's like, you know, so like they just sit in the corner, huddle, and don't move. Like they just somehow, like spiders just do not move during the light. Uh huh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's maybe, like, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it. Yeah, so like that's, it's residually came in. Uh, the metazygia, yes, they are. One of them was the same species. Maybe, yeah, so yeah, you're right, that, that 12 hours. No, we have some, like, actually, yeah, wait a second. There was some couple of spiders which have this kind of residual block of activities, but not that many. So, like, yeah, the one I show you is actually more noisy because, you know, it was very active spider. I liked him. Yes. Based on all the core mechanisms that have been described so far, every time that a light is doing something, it's not acting directly on the mechanism. Oh, it's probably indirectly. I suspect it's very, very indirectly. But I guess since I have a very simple model, that's probably the last step where it acts. So somehow it's probably activate the cascade of events, which and somehow, again, I'm not really a molecular biologist shooting myself in the foot right now, but somehow at the end of this long cascade is a mRNA degradation. I really don't have enough molecular background to actually even come up with a... So for example, in your software, him, he gets degraded by light. It's probably indirectly. But probably... The team is direct. Oh, really direct? Yeah, okay. Probably, yeah, but... Probably it's, yeah, so it's probably it's more obviously more than one mRNA. I suspect that it's probably more than one and element. There is no genomic information of any spider species? Uh, no, we have only, only a silk gland. The silk gland has been extensively sequenced. The rest of the spider, nobody ever was interested to look somehow. Most of, I mean, it's just like the silk gland get a lot of attention because of commercial interest in the silk. But outside of the, yeah, so there must be a reason why people look at and that was, And when yeah. you're saying the genomic information, you didn't find any 
Homolog yeah, and that's what that's what we are gonna do now. No, we'll look at some homolog again since we only have sealed glands. <laughs> so there is a number of like opsin homologs, for example. There is a uh, homologs of per and the uh, team in the silk gland, but right now so and again we don't have like multiple time points which is for circadian genes like you have only one time point it doesn't really help you much so but now since we collected them hopefully we will have a little bit better resolution hopefully we can find some homolog yeah yes It's only three, I mean, obviously, it's, only, it's a very simple model. It has only, I mean, yes, I can, uh, I can include, I can degrade the protein, but it won't give me enough entrainment because what I also want, there is other constraints. Like I want it to, so it's, uh, I can do it, but I don't have enough free running period. So that's the only one which actually can be bistable. So this something about this mRNA degradation, but. Obviously, it's more than one protein involved. It's probably more than one mRNA involved. It's probably everything else is dimerization involved, so in any other species. So I suspect it's probably more complex than that. But since I don't know, usually I try to not hypothesize complex mechanism, which I don't know. So yeah, it's overly simplistic. But bistability might work in some shape or form. It's maybe probably. I'm surely, no, nothing can be that simple. Even though, as a mathematician, I love it to be that simple. Uh, probably not. Yes? The last question. For yeah. the spider gene, would you implement this the simple form of cupric protein on tissue or just the whole spider? Again, since we don't know where it is, we dissect, we just basically dissect that the, like basically where central nervous system is. So which is in the head and some kind of part, which is, I forgot how it's called. But we basically collect central and peripheral system of the spiders. So and we use that ma uh, material for the gene expression profile. We hope it is central, because god, if it's peripheral, then OK. Then things are more complicated than, who knows, maybe we wasted, just, maybe, thank you, we maybe just wasted $30,000, but it's OK. Sometimes, sometimes. All right, well, with that, well, thanks. Um, Thank you.